We're back with another episode of the Quantum Yoga Podcast. Today's guest is Reverend Tiffany Barsotti. Tiffany is a clinician and researcher of subtle energy, biofield therapies, and energy psychology. With her wide use of various subtle energy devices along with her spiritual and intuitive guidance, she serves as an integrative practitioner working alongside medical doctors, naturopaths, osteopaths, and allied professionals. She received her Master's of Theology in Energy Medicine with special emphasis in medical and spiritual counseling from Holos University Graduate Seminary and was personally mentored by the school's founders, Dr. C. Norman Sheely and Carolyn Miss. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, Let's start with a, a short introduction, if you could tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, some of your story, which is fascinating. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, we all have one. Um, essentially, I moved over from the corporate world into mind-body health. Um, my interest, truth be told, has always been in quantum physics and medicine. And had there been a school that really brought those things together, that's probably a direction I would have gone in. However, I went into the entertainment industry and... Um, it was an interesting time because while I was a manager in the entertainment industry and for music artists, for the most part, I was very fortunate that I got to fill a passport and travel before I was age 30 and then get into digital copyright issues and intellectual property rights. So the fascinating thing about that was the, um, it took me back and forth between New York and San Diego, or actually between New York and LA for the most part. I'm now in San Diego. Um, so there's been a lot of shift in that brick and mortar world. When I last lived in New York, I went into, I worked for a law firm. And when I was there, we were working on specifically moving people over from the brick and mortar world to the digital world. Well, that's very different. Well, I ended up living across the street from Ground Zero, not when the buildings were had fallen, not during the, the main event, but after the, the cleanup act was going on. So it happened to be that it was the really the only apartment building that had people in it that was directly across the street. And I, I don't know all of what the implications of that are, but bottom line is I got very sick. And I had heart issues, I had lung issues, I had sinus issues, and lots of of things. And no doctor was able to figure it out. It was years and years. Um, In in fact, I was just cleaning out paperwork and looking at my whole medical history and seeing all that again and how many practitioners I had seen. Bottom line, I ended up going to see a medical intuitive And she said, you have three days to make up your mind after she came out of her trance-like state. And I was like, what does that mean? I'm in the height of my career in living in New York City, doing all these things that I feel were important. She said, yeah, but you're not on your path and you're supposed to be doing what I'm doing. And I was like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not doing that. And Um, the truth is, is that also I was a a very reluctant healer because I had always been told that since I was a child that, you know, I was clairvoyant and had clairsentient abilities and psychokinesis abilities and all of these things, but they scared the crap out of me and I didn't want any of that stuff. So to me, I had turned my back on it. It just, things that we tend to turn our back on tend to come and find us again at a later time. So this was kind of a spiritual two by four. And it whacked me pretty good. But what it ended up doing is taking me to school. And I studied with Norm Sheely and Carolyn Mace and many other modern mystics, Christine Page and uh, Karen Cremasco, so many um, just beautiful healers and teachers. So that kind of woke me up and I figured, okay, I have a, a family. I have a pod of people who do this type of work and they're all they're all doing pretty well so let me let me just investigate so i continued my studies there at holos university and now um i graduated uh, when 2010 but my practice actually started in 2005 so from day one you begin doing case studies you begin working with clients and 
at, you're always working on yourself as well. So that was sort of my personal development and how I got into this. Okay. And then and you got a lot of letters after your name. Oh, can you explain? <laughs> the alphabet soup. Can you explain some of those? Yeah. So the alphabet soup is, so it's a master's in theology, a, a clinical hypnotherapist, but actually what I teach is de-hypnosis, not hypnosis anymore. And I have, I'm a CCT, which is, stands for a clinical thermographer. So as a, as another tool that I've used and um, MCPLT is a master's in clinical past life therapy. Um, I don't remember all the all the rest of them, but essentially the the main thing is that I have a master's in theology, a clinical hypnotherapist that allows me to do these things, and I'm an ordained minister. So I have a lot of flexibility in what I'm able to do and work with with a person. That's fascinating. That it's and it's uh, it sounds all very synergistic. It ends up being that way. It's it didn't make any sense along the journey, but it it now is starting to make sense. Well, let's uh, talk about your thesis. Your, your, this is your master's thesis, right? It's fascinating, Correct. fascinating. Yeah, it was kind of, these were, you know, I have a, a belief that if we follow the breadcrumbs, we're well fed. And I was, I feel like I was just following the breadcrumbs, like this, the, the next natural thought. And these ideas kept thinking me. So in several of my courses throughout Holos, I somehow got onto the reticular activating system. Um, there were many, many people's work who influenced that, but it's, it's not an area of the brain. It's in the brainstem and the pons and PONS, but it's not measurable with fMRI. So I, I kind of knew I was going down a bit of a rabbit hole with this because I was actually looking at something that was ultimately going to be immeasurable at this time, but still fascinating. The reticular activating system is what controls our consciousness, our conscious awakeness, and if you have damage to the back head in that region of the reticular activating system, you don't have awake consciousness. So many people that have, you know, even are in comas or in what they call a locked in syndrome, they have the ability to record. They know exactly what's going on in the room and the environment around them, but they're locked in. They can't respond. So any kind of damage to the reticular activating system puts you in that sort of state. What fascinated me is that also in this region of the brain is the branch of the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus. And the vagus nerve is the only one that wanders all the way through the body. And I also found that fascinating. So it regulates so much of the nervous system. And I believe that there's a connection to the neuropeptides and neurotransmitters in how it is that our nervous system is responding to our internal environment and external environment, which I find also fascinating, which I know we're going to talk about, because that is what I love about what the bio well is, is looking at. So I know we'll talk about that. So the other piece is that this also happens to line up with this very little, it's, it's not really well known, the chakra called the Alta Major. So the Alta Major is known in several cosmologies as the mouth of God. So all of these these components of these sort of structures and the alta major any chakras are really more in the etheric body they're not necessarily in the physical body but chakras relate to the endocrine system and the glands they have a direct relationship with the neuronal complexes sorry nerve plexes sorry i didn't mean neuronal nerve plexes throughout the body so i just found this fascinating so these were sort of the ideas and I was like, well, how curious is this that all of these things are right there together? It has to do with the weight consciousness, has to do with how we process information at the vagus nerve, both internally, up and down, from gut to brain, from brain to gut, and every other organ. And this, this amazing chakra called the Alta Major that has to deal with how it is that we are receiving and perceiving things that are otherworldly, the divine. 
Can you let's dig in a little bit more into the Alta Major Chakra because we have a lot of yogis listening to this and they're well familiar with the uh, sort of accepted seven chakra system, right? Which uh, which is really interesting in a whole nother thread. There are many many traditions that have. Uh, five or 12 or a variety of different ones. Talk to us about the lineage that um, has focused on the altar major and how it relates or doesn't relate to the other more traditional ones that people are aware of. Very good. So my research kept taking me to, like I said, several cosmologies and the Native Americans, the Indians, and literally every tribe that I met, Cherokee, Navajo, Hopi, uh, so many, Iroquois, they all have their own inner relationship to this backhead chakra. The Hindus, um, Charles Fillmore, of, who is the creator of Unity Church, called this the zeal point, Z-E-A-L the zeal point, like where we literally receive zeal and, and inspiration. Um, the, the, the danger piece of this, and, and also this is in Alice Bailey's work, the theosophies, um, it's literally in every cosmology I, I looked at. And the problem is, and I think the reason it gets left out of a lot of literature is that it's a very dangerous place I shouldn't say dangerous. There's caution when interacting with the Alta Major. You don't just randomly walk up to somebody and start to open their Alta Major. There needs to be some consciousness around this. And this ties into how it is that we move Kundalini energy throughout our bodies. It needs to be kind of a, a natural evolution of how the energies move within our system. Because if you rapidly open an energy system too fast, you can actually cause damage to the nerve plexes. Hmm. And as a healer in pranic healing, P-R-A-N-I-C, pranic healing, there's also this backhead chakra, but we're taught don't mess with it. <laughs> so, and then um, Mickey Osanke, who is a, he's actually local, he's in California. Um, I think he's mostly in Inglewood, but he travels a lot to Australia. He is an esoteric acupuncturist. Now, he has dedicated his life to these theosophical teachings and started to understand the inner workings, inner workings of the Alta Major and actually has um, patterns of acupuncture, how he needles. In acupuncture school, they teach you, you don't needle this point. It's DU14, DU14 is the point in the back head. It's literally the, the area where I'm talking about is that little divot that in uh, just under the occiput in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. So that's the area, that's the region that we're talking about that all of this happens to line up. So for the yogis, and I actually wrote a, um, a paper that's in Energy Medicine Magazine about what are the implications of move, moving kundalini? Because kundalini yoga is quite on the rise, right? Yeah. Well, we need to do it with some responsibility. So, and just paying attention because the, the traffic like model I call of the, you know, the, all the colors, which is not really how I see them, all the colors that line up, you know, indigo and, and red for the base chakra and green for the heart chakra and blue for the throat. That there, it, the color combinations are far more complex than that. And the wheel, which literally means chakra, there's many layers and components to this. So what the Hindus wrote about, like the thousand petal lotus that this, that's at the crown chakra, each of them have like petals. Like think of them, you know, what a dahlia flower looks like. So there's complexities within them that have, you know, smaller petals and then there's a core. So when we're interacting with these chakras, we can bust a energy through these really fine like filters so we need to have caution as we start to move this sort of energy because done responsibly it can be quite beautiful if you can explain the multiple types of the body if or give us a framework for understanding the layers or the sheaths as we know it in yoga the uh the koshas this uh sort of ecosystem that exists from the gross to the fine. So this would be a great segue into the bio well, because it can see much of this. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. Thank you. Um, by the way, I want to interject something just before I say that. Candace Pert, who is an amazing scientist, wrote The Molecules of Emotion. And what she said is that we are hardwired for bliss. And in, when, when you think about the, the chakra with our consciousness, with our conscious awareness as being something that opens, that we have this beautiful perception of our outside world to our inside world and that we are able to move energy consciously throughout our bodies, we are really doing a service to every cell in our body. So it's, it's a beautiful thing because she found the endorphin receptor on every single cell site which happened to, prior to her work, was thought to only exist in the brain. But turns out that it's on every single cell. So that's, it's quite a beautiful um, attribute to our physical bodies. So the, and let's have a, a dialogue because I don't um, operate in the koshas. I know some of them, but I, I want to interrelate with you on this a bit more. Let's start with the uh, physical. I guess that would be a good starting place for all our materialists that are listening. <laughs> and, <laughs> Very and good. A little bit more fine from there. Yeah. And you know, our physical body is so darn convincing that in, it really says that this reality is our reality. And the truth is, is that we have more refined aspects of of our awareness and our movement through space and time. So our physical body is, is the, the densest part. So, but literally when we look at it, there it's all vibrational constituents, how we hear from our tympanic membrane. It's all done through vibration, through how the bits and molecules and atoms and the atomic structures that have a certain vibration actually register at our retinal nerve. If taken literally, you would, I would be, if you study the brain and how the eyes work, I, you would, I'd be seeing you really teeny, teeny, tiny, because I'm looking at you on video right now, and upside down, and there would be two of you. Well, there's something that happens in the translation of how it is that we're perceiving our actual world to what is, um, well, what's actual, what is, what is happening in our ability to perceive another person. It's not just what our eyes are doing. So the physical is the densest part of our structure, you could say. And then the next one out in how I look at this is the etheric body. The etheric body sits two and four inches off of the body. There's a couple different mm, sort of frames within the etheric body. And it's where the, uh, the chakras and also the translational components to the meridian system sit. So because it's, it's a lot energetic in how it is that this information transfer happens. So the etheric body is bringing in information, you can say, that gets translated into the, the densest physical. And what I mean by saying that it's so darn convincing that our physical body is actually the one that is having the doing and the action, that's true, but it's also bringing in information that's surrounding us. And and, in, and in, at what point do the electromagnetic fields of the body interface? Are they, uh, in this uh, worldview, are they in the physical body or are they the, in the etheric body or are they sort of vibrating in between the two? Where do you see that fitting in? Great question. Um, we don't have a definitive answer for that, but how I perceive it is that there's, you can have different waveforms and activity that happens within those waves and like broadband waves they're very stochastic and you know kind of a randomization and they're, they're very sharp whereas the sine wave that is how the heart operates you know is like literally these like smooth lines so if we look at a frequency generator and we're looking at how it is that um something is registering or an oscilloscope, we're literally measuring these sorts of activities at, with the waveform. How are we receiving and perceiving these? They're at different levels of the body, I, I feel and believe. Mm. Because our physical body 
has its own sets of waves and, you know, there are many properties to particles besides the molecular structure and the subatomic structures to them. There's also a wave structure. So do we want those things that are outside of our innate way of being, they have kind of a, a bombardment. So if we're constantly being bombarded by Wi-Fi or different things, these are, these are waveforms that are not natural to our, our regular states of physicality. Mm, okay. So as far as a, a frequency, I couldn't tell you when, as, as we talk here now, because we don't have a way of measuring this, and it is something I'm working on, but we don't have the ability to say, okay, this is the frequency or the hertz at the mental field or the emotional or the etheric or the two different or the different layers of the etheric. This gets more complex as well because each level has seven other levels. So you have seven main and then you have subs within that. <laughs> so it gets highly complex. Um, there is a practice that I do called biofield tuning and Eileen McCusick is a wonderful teacher and uh, sort of she is the creator of this and she uses tuning forks and you can really tune your ear to become very distinct about the different frequencies and the things that you hit in somebody's field. So there is a map to this. Not only is there an internal map, but there's an external map. And something else that you would ask me about the chakras is I, on a regular basis, use about 360 chakras because there's minor chakras and major chakras. So in the pranic healing system, there are 11 main chakras. So there's a whole lot of different tonal changes that you can hear if you're using different apparatus, but we don't have refined instruments enough to actually perceive these changes. Well, this is a, uh, the biofield was something I wanted to ask you about as well in your understanding of the biofield anatomy. Uh, so if you can use that too, to reference these other subtle, subtler components of the bodies that you're about to mention and let us mm -hmm. know where they fit in. Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, there's, there's different philosophies along these lines, but while I'm speaking about Eileen's method of biofield tuning and her biofield anatomy, um, typically the way that we see things is the right side of the, the body in both the bio well and biofield in, and in many philosophies, that's the masculine side of the body. The left side is the more feminine side of the body. And when we, it's something to pay attention to, if you mostly injure yourself or things happen on the right side, it's something to, to look at. It has to do with our tendency to overdo and be more masculine and have more activity in the world. We need a balance is the truth. And whereas the feminine can relate to mother, right side can relate to uh, father. So you've got these, these kind of polarities within the structures of how it is that we look at this from an anatomical and also giving you information about the person with whom you're speaking. Are there, do there happen to be um, issues on the mother side? Then you might injure yourself or things could happen more on the left side of the body. So And the etheric body that you were speaking about previous is part of the biofield? Yes, absolutely. And so is the mental, and so is the emotional. And you could say so is the causal. So let me just make a, a map of this for the people who are listening. The most outer field, let's say as far as you can stretch your arms out in both directions, and as though you could really reach beneath your feet and above your head, this is like the circumference of your field that let's say you have I'm going to use a, a strong word, you have control over. <laughs> That's, I use that word loosely. Um, the causal field, causal, C-A-U-S-A-U-A-L, did I spell that right? Um, is the, the outer field that we really don't have any say about. These are things that were having to do with the family that you were born into, the the day you were born, your birth name, the date you were born, who your siblings are, all of these, these details were set into motion, you could say, prior to your conscious awareness. 
So that's a field that's out there that contains information. The part that starts to get more interesting to me is the mental field, the emotional field, and the etheric field, because these are the domains that have to do with our operational consciousness. The mental is next inward from the causal, and next inward of that is the emotional, and next inward of that is the etheric, both layers, and the next inward of that is the physical structure. That was a great summation. Okay, good. <laughs> and so everything, is it true then that everything outside or all these fields that are uh, subtler than the physical body are part of this biofield? Absolutely. And biofield isn't just a word that somebody made up. It's actually an accepted scientific term at this point, as I understand it, and endorsed by the National Institute of Health. And you can actually plug that, that term into PubMed and come up with of studies and articles as well as in, I think you mentioned Google Scholar is another way to search for that. Absolutely. And in fact, I wrote a paper on with several colleagues on biofield sciences and looking at devices. And we spoke about really broadly, we have a long version and a short version of the paper. The longer version of what we wrote will be in um, integrative medicine, the scientific basis our scientific basis of integrative medicine. I forget how the title goes. Anyway, the third edition should be out of that book any day. And so we really went into depth with these details. So all of that is searchable on PubMed. The part having to do with um, having definitive studies on the biofield, mm. this, is, this is tough, but what we're having to do, it's like a, a merging of, you know, some people like to say science and spirituality. And the, the Hindus or in the, the Vedantas would say, we have it backwards. It's, it's actually all been part of the same system. It's just in our Western way of thinking about things, we take things apart in order to put them back together and then try and make sense out of them. But in the nature of taking something apart, you have actually dismantled the wholeness of it. Mm. So, and there's, there's a lot more to keeping the summation of the parts together and getting the information that is collective. The realm of the biofield, which is so exciting and it's burgeoning right now, and it really is the intersection point of so many healing modalities. What's interesting is that if you get a really good Ayurvedic practitioner, these Vijas that are in just incredibly astute at reading the pulses, they will tell you what event happened in your past that has to in your pulse that mm. could have to do with something of your birth. So where is that information actually coming from? So there's, it's fascinating when you think about this and this is this idea about the, the science and the spiritualism of, of who we are. And let me clarify by spirituality. I, I think we get a lot of things mixed up at times that it's like a belief system and the way I differentiate spirituality is it's your own relationship with whatever you perceive the creator or the divine to be. There's no dogma. And so the science has a dogma. So these, these things kind of just don't really go together, but yet they, you can't separate them either. We, we can't remove consciousness. It, it's not removable. Right. You take consciousness out of the, the equation and you got a lopsided equation. You're not going to be able to answer it. Let's talk about the bio well. I've been learning about the bio well from you. I've done a training with you. It's fascinating. And the more I learn about it, the more questions I have. Give the listeners just a very short summation of what the bio well is and does. Okay. So the bio well now is the current edition of a technology that was called gas discharge visualization. It is literally a device. It's a, a medical device or a wellness device. Um, it's been used widely throughout the world for the last, I think we're up to 22 years. And it's used in 14 different countries as a diagnostic device. In the US, we say that it's a wellness device because it's not gone through uh, federal, the FDA system of having the validations, et cetera, per um, a validation study or a clinical study or things like that. That's extremely expensive. So they just haven't gone that route. So for here, it's a wellness assessment tool. So the, 
the what we're doing is measuring the meridians that end at the fingertips. So maybe some listeners know that the meridians end at the fingertips and at our toes. And what we're doing is there is a, a movement of energy. So there's software that's built in. So you have this small device. It's now small. It used to not be this small. So the BioWell is the, the latest version that is this small one. That's the one that you have that we did the training on. And you put all 10 fingers on a pure crystal plate. That, that plate is underneath it, there's a CCD camera that stands for a charged coupled device. That means that it's taking thousands of pictures per milliseconds and it is layering those pixels. Those pixels are then turned into data. Those pixels are essentially coming out of an electron cloud that happens as you, on the software, say capture, there is a small charge that you don't feel that goes to the end of your fingertip that causes a perturbation that's like a little cloud, a gas discharge cloud. The CCD camera takes thousands of pictures per second and is, creates this pixelated layer look. This is Carillion photography for the 21st century. So this is um, using now the data that can be quantified because our technology has come so far in video, in computers, in uh, you know all of the, the sciences. So it then creates a map. It looks like it's taking a picture of your aura, but that's not what it is. It is based on the traditional Chinese medicine model, TCM, in the five element theory. And you are, it looks as though one of the outputs, as you've seen, that there's a, an aura field around the body with different colors. And there might be some correlations that we can make to that. However, the map is each system and organ is mapped around the body based on the finger template of these meridians. There contains information there, whether it's low functioning, high functioning, is there excess, is there deficiencies, things like that. It's, you, yeah, it's amazing. Tell us how the... Uh, how this integrates with the chakras, because there is a window in there that can show you uh, some yeah. pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. So the beautiful thing about the BioWell, and this goes back to what I was saying before about the internal environment to the external environment, the what it's actually seeing is how are we managing our energy? And that can be psycho, spiritual, emotional, energetic, all of these ways that we manage our energy. And so is this, if the chakras are, oh gosh, there's so much here. The chakras are how it is that we are also managing our energy. So a person that is actually reading chakras or seeing, they're like, oh, what? you're walking around with a divot or some hole in your solar plexus chakra. Well, that could have been because, because some event just happened where it feels like, damn, I just got punched in the gut. Not literally but emotionally like, oh God, that really hurt. You know, like you just, you just got knocked in the gut. Well, energetically, you can see that kind of thing. And that's what the bio well is able to detect is where are you, how are you managing that? And we all get punched in the gut every once in a while, but how resilient are we? How, how do we come back from that? So the bio well is reading real time and PS it's about as stable as blood. So people think of blood as being a very st like a static measure. And there is some, there are some normal range, ranges, obviously, for our homeostasis, but it's a very dynamic way that our blood actually changes. Because some event changes within you, you're going to see the changes in blood work. Mm -hmm. It's just our testing is a little bit slow. Mm -hmm. So the bio well is giving you real time information about things that are transpiring in your body. And as the, you have mentioned in some other uh, in, in other teachings about chakras, chakras really are an interface point for multiple bodies, right? So yes. you were talking about uh, emotional effects and the impact that it will have on the chakra. There are psychological impacts on the chakra as well as etheric and physical effects on the chakra. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, you know, it used to be that the old model of how the, the 
mind body or body mind actually perceive information was all emotional constituents were processed in the limbic system. And what we now know is that it has a lot to do with neuropeptides and our neurotransmitters that are all throughout and have to do with our cellular reception. Literally, these are protein-like molecules that modulate the inner communications of our body. So oftentimes what I say is that every thought creates a hormone. Every, every action that we take creates some cascade of change within our system. So this is very much registered at the chakra level. Yeah, and what's so what, what's it's it's almost frustrating in a way is that there's so much data just in it, that you can you can dig into from looking at okay let's let's say for example someone's heart chakra is uh, two joules and fifty percent misaligned to the left side of the body. Well, geez, now we need to. We need to dig into all of the the psychology behind that one chakra, all the emotionality of that chakra, the location it being off to the left, like you mentioned earlier, being right. left side, feminine side, mother side, the the physicality of the association there and what's happening in the heart and the other glands and organs that are around that and the nerve plexi there they all they all integrate and it's really hard to say and maybe you can t you can speak to this how much of each one of those bodies is affecting the chakra so thank you for that partly what sent me to in my interest in in really doing some of the work that I also did in my master's thesis and really this got going through my love of exercise and love of, of being in the physical body and using the physical body. I, um, I, I think athletics and, and yoga is an amazing, we have such an incredible technology that we barely understand in our physical. And I was always fascinated. Well, what happens out here? And my, my hands are outstretched in front of me and all around me. What happens out in the field that is causing an effect into my physical body. Because we all have experiences where we've walked in a room and felt like something really funny or funky that just didn't feel right. Or you've walked into a space and it feels really refined and very beautiful and you just feel loved and accepted. Well, that's our systems perceiving information around us. So how that has a, a deeper effect. There's a transmission there through these various bodies. So I think it's fascinating that the mental is the most outer field that we have sort of control over, where it is that we're putting our mental attention, where we focused, um, where ideas are, are thought about, the concepts come up, and then inward of that is the emotional. So then we're processing the emotions of those ideas that we're thinking about. So it's fascinating. All of those things have these kind of filtering effect all the way down into the physical. It would be good, I believe, if we could handle things that are in the outer fields before they have to register in our body. Mm. By the time something has taken up space in our physical body, whether it be no matter what kind of ailment, and we all have to, we all deal with these things at times and it's for our maximum learning. But usually by the time something has gotten into our physical body, it's traversed along many pathways. And then in our physical body, there's nothing like when our physical body gets our attention. Mm -hmm. right. So that was my way of thinking through that. I've been meaning to ask you about, there's another pain in there uh, on stress, like stress analysis pain. And mm -hmm. it, it gives you a parameter for emotional pressure Mm -hmm. uh, overall energy, organ balance, left, right system balance. And I have been using HRV or heart rate variability for those who are unaware of HRV. Fascinating, great window into the health and the workings of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, I'm wondering how much, uh, have you done any correlation, uh, whether that's sort of just observational or come across studies between uh, what the biowell can measure and what HRV can measure? Yeah, there are different mechanisms, as you know. 
what I love about HRV, heart rate variability, is that there's a, a direct relationship to the vagus nerve. So what you're actually getting is the balance of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and how is the autonomic nervous system interrelating between both of those systems. There's, there's a time for rest and digest and sleep and, and all of these kinds of things that have to do with more of our parasystem. But when you really need your parasystem to be operational is when you are taking it easy, when you're sitting down, um, getting ready for bed, things like that. You need your paratone to be able to have some flexibility. Our sympathetic tone is our action. It's our doing. And it's, it's great. We need to have that. In our wake states, there needs to be that sort of dynamic. But if we get stuck in either one, it's, there's nothing positive really about that. We need the balance of the two. So HRV can give you that feedback. And it is used as a neurofeedback tool, so to speak, um, that you are able to start regulating your breath more. It helps you be more mindful of what, where... What were you just thinking about that if you're walking around with a heart math device or EM wave or anything else like that, you can see, oh, shoot, that thought just put me in the red zone. Okay, so it helps you actually to have more of a regulation of your nervous system by watching. That said, it also can be a little crazy making because you can you just get so attentive to these things. How it, ma- it maps up with the bio well, the bio well is seeing accumulation of these things as well. So... I think that the HRV is more sensitive real time to what is exactly going on thought by thought. Mm. As you know, with that uh, stress analysis that's in the bio well, we can ask yes or no questions. We can ask, you know, like, is it, should I go get this sur- surgery? And let's look at what these, these questions are having an effect. Did it send our energy way spiky? Or did it actually calm us down? If there's any procedures or things like that, it's good to to look at those things. All of those measures that you were just mentioning, the emotional pressures, the left-right balance, they all obviously have a particular meaning individually and collectively. So the emotional pressure is having to do with how is it that we are managing our psycho-spiritual, emotional, energetic bodies or the information that we're perceiving. And I think you remember from class what we were talking about it. When I see somebody that's all the way in the calm, like under two on a, a regular, this is the range that goes from two to 10, sorry, from one to 10 in the, the dynamic range. And if you're under two on a regular basis, I have cause for concern that there's either you're extremely repressed in your emotions or you just came out of a meditative state and then by all means you should be in that calm state. But if you're operating in that place on a regular basis and you're not having the dynamic range of your parasympathetic and your sympathetic system moving as it it should with some flexibility and dexterity, then there's usually an issue. And PS, I happen to find that a lot in um, people that have had chronic disease, that Mm -hmm. they're all the way in a repressed place where they have been avoiding some of their emotions and things that have been going on. Mm -hmm. So it always gives me room to ask more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So uh, I wanted to touch on another fascinating uh, pearl of study that you've been involved with, which is called endobiogeny. I've not heard of this before you mentioned it. And then you started talking about hormones and values and ratios. And I was, I was floored. Uh, (laughs) So can you, can you, uh, can you introduce us to endobiogeny and uh, how you use that in your practice in relation to, to the bio well and other, other devices or modalities? Yeah. Beautiful. I love it. Love it. Love it. As both a clinician and a researcher, when I see things line up and what I saw, I had, I had been using the GDV for about 15 years and I was invited to do a medical fellowship in endobiogeny. Um, I guess it was four or five years ago, four years ago now. And so it was a two year fellowship. And essentially, because I'm not a physician, and I don't have the ability to do blood draws, I don't actually use it like other physicians who are trained in the fellowship. It is a a method, it's an art and science of looking at how it is that the endocrine system manages every aspect of our life. 
And if you think about it, and there will be many people that will argue this point with me, and I'm happy to have the argument, because the, it, the endocrine system is really the only system that's there from beginning of life to our end of life. And when we look at it, how it manages literally this hormonal cascade, the things that change, you know, we're talking about the more subtle ends with thoughts and things like that. But if you have a genetic predisposition, if you know what, whatever could be going on, if your tendency is to have spleen congestion or liver congestion or pelvic congestion, we're able to see so much more by the blending of these ratios. So to back up a little, in endobiogeny, we use a CBC with differential the physicians with whom I'm trained and with whom I work on a regular basis, use the CBC with differential and you are then putting it into the algorithm that is part of what we call the biology of functions so that we can then see the interrelationship. Oh, you know, your, your thyroid looks normal. Then why do I have all these, you know, your regular blood work? Why do I have all these symptoms if my thyroid is actually in the normal range? And this is a common complaint for people. Right, right. Okay. So in endobiogeny, we can tell a whole story because we're taking about those 15 to 17 different biomarkers that come in a regular CBC with differential and plug them into the biology of functions algorithms. And now we're seeing an interrelationship between them all. And you get about 140 to 180 different parameters to look at that are systemically looking at the functions. We're looking at overall functional and systemic operations of the body. Hmm. So it just gives you so much more information. So then you could see, well, that thyroid thing that, well, that's where it's manifesting, but we need to tease out, is this an adrenal problem first? Is it a liver congestion problem first? Is it in the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis? What are those things? Because it makes a very different um, outcome for how it is that you're going to treat. What are you going to triage first? Mm -hmm. And this is also what I have seen so beautifully match up with the bio well. There's, I mean, like down to bio well uses energy in, in you know, in, in numbers of joules. And in the endobiogeny biology of functions, we're using ratios. So it's all you can get to, you know, an inf infinite amount of decimal points to move over. So you're able to then see, are you in the millions or are you in super low? There are things that we need to, for homeostasis, be within a balanced range of, hmm. which I believe is a dynamic process. So it is a, uh, you can look it up. There's some endobiogeny online, which literally means the function of life. And um, it is, it's really a beautiful art form that can answer a lot of questions. So uh, it, it's fascinating because this kind of does tie into starting our discussion around the different sheaths or the different uh, subtle layers of the body in the physical body. You have these three super systems that are well well covered in functional medicine, the neuroendocrine uh, immunological system, this NEI syst super system, right, that kind mm -hmm. of uh, regulates the entire body. So you should see... Uh, hormonal matching to what's happening with the autonomic nervous system. And yeah. then if you were even to test uh, test uh, markers in the immune system, you should see these things telling a similar story from a different perspective. That's true. And that's, that's exactly what fascinates me as a researcher and a clinician, because I want to look for more than one point that's telling me that something needs to be worked on with a person. Mm. Whether I'm doing, you know, my focus is that I do psychos, my focus is in my practice at Heal and Thrive is I'm looking for the psycho-spiritual emotional root causes of what's going on with the, the organ and system and the person, the whole person. I'm looking at whole person, which is why I like involving endobiogeny and the bio well and all these other tools, et cetera, that we can use. Because then we can see that the story is actually not just saying unilaterally, oh, my test over here shows this. And so then I'm going to go there and therefore treat only that. I'm like, okay, well, let's look at the whole story that's around that. And that's essentially um, what I find necessary as a clinician and researchers that we hit from multiple points and really think about it. 
And I appreciate that about functional medicine. To me, in the perfect world, you would have endobiogeny and functional medicine be working together Mm. because functional medicine tends to uh, ask a lot of tests that can be very expensive and tends to towards a lot of supplementation. And being able to find out whether a person can actually handle the supplementation would be a good thing. How well do they methylate? All of these kinds of things. And uh, functional medicine can see those things, which is helpful. And endobiogeny can tell a deeper story there. I, so can the bio. Yeah. And it, so this is, uh, this is more about your observations in your practice and your, and your, your clients. How much, how much of people's physical ailments are the result of psycho-emotional, spiritual dysfunction? for lack of a better word, and how much of it originates in just the physical dimension, the Mm -hmm. 4D dimension. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I like the the ratio of 80-20. I think 80-20 is the the Pareto law uh, in statistics and economics and, you know, the 80% of our life experience versus the 20% of our life experience. So I, I have no actual measure of that, but because I like the 80, 20 rule, I'm just going to apply it here. So I'm going to say, you know, there's, there are such thing as congenital defects. There are such thing that we have as genetic flaws. So we're born into this path, you could say, and from a, past life therapy point of view. And really I call a lot of my work emotional memory therapy because some people are really triggered by past life therapy. And I don't necessarily care where we go in a session to find it. If we end up in a past life, then fine. But my, my desire is not to take you to the past life where then where you made the contract, so to speak, of getting this congenital issue. However, I do find links there. So This 20% is what I will put in the category of more of a, like a a genetic disorder or something like that. I would say the 80% is our, uh, our choices, the choices we make in our lifestyle, the things that we really do have control over, where it is that we're putting our minds and our thoughts. And many of us think, well, gosh, my thoughts think me sometimes, you know, even that's what I said, even about my thesis. Well, sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing. So being able to ascertain that is how beneficial are these aspects of my psycho-spiritual, emotional, energetic world? How am I managing my energy on my own? So I would say that a good amount, 80%, is having to do with our lifestyle choices, which is everything from body-mind, where we're putting our thoughts and our emotions, as well as what we're putting in our mouth, how much do we move, how well do we sleep, all, all those pillars How do we digest? Digestion isn't just digestion of food. It's also digestion of our emotions. Mm. I'd like to circle back to a comment you made uh, at at the beginning of the conversation around kundalini and how this is becoming a a practice that is gaining a popularity. And what's interesting, if you do look into the early Hatha 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 yogic literature, you know, uh, medieval era, sort of 14, 1500s, that this, this then became the focus. It became the, the, it would about releasing the Kundalini, channeling it upwards, connecting it to the pineal, but before doing that, preparing oneself for that process. And, and uh, it, can you talk, can you speak to, can you speak to sort of healthy kundalini activation and maybe recommendations that you might have? Mm-hmm. Thank you for bringing this up. It's interesting because kundalini has a direct translation to power and force. And in our Western world, we really have so much having to do with how it is that our mental activities drive our power and force and how it is that we think through things. Where, where is it that we are wanting control in our lives? The Kundalini energy is literally the movement of it's, you know, seven uh, cir- cir- coils within the base chakra is how it's described in, in much of the ancient literature and we unfurl these serpents that make the Ida Pingala 
uh, I don't, they don't make the Ida Pingala, but they, the energy travels along the Ida Pingala, which is the right and left side movement that interweaves back and forth over the Sutratma. The Sutratma is the etheric energy line within the body that connects us from the top of our heads, and some even believe to the high heavens, to through the perineum that grounds us into earth. So these are energy lines that the Kundalini operates from. We can contain a good amount of Kundalini energy force and we can cultivate it through breath practices. Some people like to um, use medicinals and go to plant medicine to have a third eye experience or a pineal awakening or, you know, whatever. Um, I personally believe in using the breath. I think you can do a lot using your breath and though that's the ancient method as well as the pranayama. And as well as, you know, Peruvian shamans would say that it's also an ancient practice to be able to use the plant medicines. So I have no judgment there, but my personal preference is to use breath. So as you move these energies and it's just important not to, when you get into a stuck place and I have practiced Kundalini myself, but when you reach like a, there's like a threshold where you feel like the energy is not, it's like hitting a ceiling. It's to pay attention to that. Don't bust through it. Leave, leave time and space for what are the emotions that could be coming up with that. And also look at the motivation. What is our motivation for even moving this energy? Why, why is it that we want to unfurl these serpent coils from our base spine? What is, what is it? Is it for life regeneration? Is it for cleansing our blood? Is it for getting through and open to the heart chakra? Well, why? What is motivating that? And it's different for each one of us. Every level, you could say at the chakra where these nerve plexes are, we need to take our time. And they just naturally open. And it's important not to be forceful with it. And I think a lot of responsible kundalini teachers, uh, yoga teachers are teaching that to, to really not be forceful about it and really look at your motivation for why it is that we're moving the energy. So you don't just follow a class model in doing it. The part that I think is important is there's a fairly new theory out there called the polyvagal theory. Mm. Are you familiar with it? Vaguely, but if you can explain that, it'd be great. I'll do my best. It's very, pretty complex. There's a lot on PubMed. Um, it's funny because I was actually asked to include it in my thesis, but at that time it was a brand new theory. And I was advised by one of my advisors don't you dare include that in because now you're going to have to defend his thesis and your thesis, mm. even though I find it very supportive now after having spent some years with it. So the idea is, is that we have a myelinated vagus and a non-myelinated vagus, the vagus nerve. And myelination literally means the sheath around the nerve. And we can have many issues and disorders without when we lose myelination. So this is part of an MS and Parkinson's issues and, and things like that where the myelination is affected. So Stephen Porges, who is the author of this theory, says that because we come from a phylogenetic, which is essentially from fish, our evolutionary system, that our we have a, a change at the diaphragm. And this above the diaphragm is supposed to be myelinated and below the diaphragm is non-myelinated. So there, there's reasons for that because we want the myelination as we go towards the neuronal complexes that are in the brain and how it is that our synapses are wired, et cetera. The, the myelination is extremely important. There's something in our structure with why it is that nature built us this way. There's also a lot that's said to when people have psychotic disorders or things that are going on, whether how well did their myelination actually work above the diaphragm. In, in their evolutionary genetic makeup. So we could go on the deep end with that for a long time. But. Yeah, we're worthy of a, of a whole nother episode discussion, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tiffany, I want to be respectful of your time. We're here at about an hour. And uh, so please let the listeners know if they would like to learn more about you or uh, potentially work with you, what's the best way to get in touch and, and to do that? 
Well, thank you for that. And I, I love sharing information. And to me, being human and having this journey together and being in Earth School together is fun. And yes, it's filled with challenges and just ripe with opportunity to learn all the time. So this sharing with you is is part of that. And I thank you for this and your work that you're doing. And I'm so excited for you to be uh, doing the practices because you're extremely sensitive and in reading into the bio well. So I look forward to that. Um, to answer your other question, I have a website, healandthrive.com. And it, just how it sounds, H-E-A-L-A-N-D, Thrive. Dot com and um, on there if you want to book a free 15 minute consult that's that's doable if you anything is doable so set you can book sessions or you can book and there's a lot of information that I've put on my website about the biofield and links to my papers and more to come on that for sure well thanks again Tiffany and uh, good luck with everything thank you you too.